All right, one more Chris Rock joke. He is my favorite Reformed theologian, if you're, you know, wondering. Um, He said marriage is so hard, marriage is so hard that Nelson Mandela got a divorce. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in an African prison, solitary confinement, bad prison food, tortured and beaten, and literally he came home from prison back to his wife and he made it six months and he had to get a divorce. Like, I can't do this, you know, that's how hard marriage is. All right, so we've said if you're in a relationship, married or dating, um, the place we started last night was basically welcome to the club, the Struggling Humans Club. Let me tell you a little about our organization. Uh, Basically, if you're not a member of our club, you're a member of another club. Um, Anyway, the rest of us are struggling And as we said, marriage kind of has to begin with that acknowledgement of like, hey, I don't get it and you don't either and we're kind of a mess and we both need mercy and growth. And we looked at four areas we need to look at. We just looked at intimacy and we said that the two most important pieces in a relationship are intimacy and mutuality, that I get to exist and so do you and we're close. What? Yes, sir. So we're realizing the website said this ends at 1030, uh, the brochure, and we had, our announcement says it ends at 1130. So he's going to 1130. So if you now have a child care emergency, you might want to take care about that. We're sorry about our website because we're broken. <laughs> <laughs> but expectations matter. So we are going to 1130. If you need to dash out, it will only hurt our feelings a little bit. Go in peace. Good, yeah, I need more than 30 minutes. All right, so lastly, we're going to talk about um, the second I, in essence, identity. Um, Can I be me and can you be you, and how do we work that out? In other words, mutuality. In other words, what we're going to talk about is conflict. Because if I'm me and you're you, we're going to have conflict, you know? We both got to exist. We both got to matter. Because, you know, you're living the terrible nightmare of being married to someone who is not you. All right? <laughs> now, I'm not sure I would want to be married to me. But anyway, um, so we're going to talk about conflict and the potential of fighting. Because if I mean you, you were gonna, we're going to have conflict. If you're exactly the same, then one of you is technically unnecessary. So I'm glad you're different, and I'm glad you have conflict. So point one, conflict is not necessarily bad. In fact, it's actually good in many ways. You codependent pleasers, you heard it here. Conflict basically happens, married or not, when you have a relationship with two people in it, both of whom have brains, all right? Million, billion-dollar government grants have demonstrated the following— that relationships are always more difficult with two people in them, all right? That's your tax dollars at work, all right? So healthy conflict is basically how two, you know, individuals make sense of not being the same person. Those couples will go, oh, we never fight. I'm like, yuck, really? Something's missing there. One of you's absent or a pleaser or you're both conflict avoidant, but something's getting watered down, you know? Two alive people are going to have conflict And we can resolve that, and that's going to actually lead to deeper intimacy, okay? I was talking to a client once, and he had just, he had fallen in love. The last month has been just bliss. She's perfect. She's wonderful. We do stuff every day. We do stuff every night. Everything's wonderful. I mean, what do you think, Doc? What's our next step? And I said, well, I think you need to have a fight. And he's like, we don't fight, though. Okay? And I said, well, then pick a fight. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you can't really know her or have real intimacy with her unless you'll have a fight. Okay, it's like what the, the seraph says to Neo in the Matrix 2. You know, how do you truly know someone until you fight them, all right? So conflict's cool, but that's not the real problem area, all right? That's not the plot twist. The real problem area is, you know, you have a disagreement because your spouse is not getting you, or you don't feel like they're letting you matter, 
Or maybe you walk in and they've left their clothes on the floor again. You know those things. Norma cleans up behind me. I mean right behind me. Okay? Like I like to cook and I like chop an onion and I'll put the knife down and reach for the garlic and I'll look back and the knife is clean. It's in the knife block. I'm like, where'd my knife go? You know, I tease her that if I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, I come back and she's made up my side of the bed. You know, I'm like, back off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, or you need them emotionally and they blow you off, or you need them sexually and they blow you off, or, you know, they tell, tell you how to drive, you know, the marriage killer. Anyway, basic conflict stuff. <laughs> but instead of working through the problem or asking for what I need in a healthy adult way, <laughs> um, you get that fed up feeling, you know the one, and you snap and you jab and you say stuff like, you know what, I'm really sick of, or you know, you really are just like my dad, you know. Or the room just gets icy, you know, like the... Um, when the Dementors come in Harry Potter, you know, they're like, you can feel it, you know. And your hurt turns to anger or your, your fear turns to anger. Remember I alluded last night that anger is a secondary emotion. It's a, it's a defense against feeling vulnerable feelings. So if I feel hurt or fearful, it'll, it's real easy to turn that into anger. And so now I'm hurt and so I attack them. Or say something ugly or cutting or jerky, or I go silent, or I back off and punish them, or I pout. And what was once conflict is now a fight. Okay, so point one, conflict, good. Fight, not good. All right? Conflicts and fights are different things. Now, fights are what I want to focus on the most because as long as two people can stay in a, solving a problem in a conflict, you know, we can solve that. No big, all right? But once it starts, once it turns into a fight, you ain't trying to solve anything anymore, Cinderella, all right? You're just trying to win, and they're hurt, and they're angry, and you're, you're beating each other up, and you're trying to be right, and old Mr. Problem that started this whole thing, he's sitting over there all by himself, and nobody's even paying attention to him because you're busy beating each other up. Which is like, like we said last night, why you're still having the same fights since college. Because you never solved the problem, we're just fighting. Okay, so today I want to sort of deconstruct fighting and conflict. They're by definition these sort of f complex flowing dances um, full of like emotional reactivity and loadedness. And I want to sort of break them down a little bit. I want to sort of slow them down like the matrix and sort of look at the pieces of them and try to give you some kind of left brain tools, some frontal lobe tools for these very reactive events, okay? I want to get real practical here. I want you to have some things you can take with you, some stuff you can do differently at home this week, because once you're triggered in the fight, you're not thinking anymore. And so I'm going to try to give you some categories for, for getting back to frontal lobes and actually thinking and, and intervening so fights don't just spiral. Now, the only danger with practical is that there's a danger of it coming across oversimplified, okay? This is not miracle cure. This is not raise up your spouse in the way that she should go, and when she is old, she will not depart from it. That's not what we're talking about. Um, what we're shooting for is some themes and ways to help you think. And as I give them to you, something you're going to go, yeah, but what about so-and-so? And I want you thinking that. Because then you're going to come back and help me put meat on the bones in Q&A, like you did last night, all right? Also, another thing I'm assuming in this talk that we talked about last night is this talk in a lot of ways assumes this is about fighting or conflict between two people who are repentant. Remember that dynamic? They're at least both open to saying, yeah, I don't want to fight either. Let's work this out. As opposed to that spouse who's like, I'll yell at you any, any amount I want, you know? Um, we'll touch on that unrepentant person some here, like we did some last night. Um, but I'm going to assume mostly that you're not just into winning. Um, if you are dealing with somebody who's just a bully, listen to my difficult people talk on the podcast or have me back. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Number one, we're going to talk about what we should do with a fight once you know you're in one. All right? Once you realize we've, you know, Thelma and Louise off this cliff, you know, what actually are we going to do with that? All right. Number two, I want to think about 
sort of how do we understand what's happening with a fight? The secret to getting out of a fight and the secret to managing it is to be able to get to a place where you can think. It's the only thing that's going to save you. All right? What am I needing here? What did this trigger in me? What is she needing here? Okay? Because if you don't, your amygdala or your hypothalamus or your you know, midbrain, whatever, is just going to keep running and running and running this thing like the Terminator down to its hyper metal alloy skeleton going and going okay so we got to stop it all right um number four number three we got to address the hurt this is super important when you're fighting you hurt people and we got to address that or else and fourth how do we resolve the problem you know the original problem that started this thing remember him no because we forgot about him because we got in a fight right so first rule of fight club is we better talk about fight club all right, let's go. Number one, what do we do when the fight bomb hits? Someone was asking me a question about this last night. I can't remember it. But they were talking about, ah, fighting in front of the children. Remember that question? Yeah, okay. That was such a great question. Um, I'm going to pick up here, and this is going to be relevant to that question. Once you realize you're fighting, once you realize it's escalated, once you're saying, you know, those things you've wanted to say, <laughs> um, first thing I want you to do is go to timeout. You put your kids in timeout, put yourself in timeout, all right? This is so underused. People are like, we fought for four hours. I'm like, why? <laughs> once you've crossed the line, there's no way anything productive is going to happen. What that means is somebody says, I'm, 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 wait, I'm too angry. I need to stop. Or, wow, that felt really hurtful. I think I need a break. Right? We're losing control here. You know? So once you feel that jolt, once you, you feel that anger rise, and you're saying stuff like, what did you say? Or I can't believe, that's the stupidest. Or, you know, I had a, a couple in my office once, and this guy says something, and his wife just does this. She goes, and I'm like, dude, run, go, you know, I'll, I'll hold her off, you know, it was scary, it was so slow, anyway, once you feel that jolt, once it gets ugly, the first thing to do is not do what comes naturally, okay, see, when we encounter pain or frustration or hurt or whatever, something important happens in our brains, we start triggering kind of our early reptile brain, you know, our caveman brain that basically is fight, flight, or freeze. Those are kind of your options there, like a caveman. You know, your options are like kill T-Rex or run from him. That's kind of the only, that's the level of, of sophistication here. So we nag or we withdraw or we criticize or we attack or we yell or we scream or we become roommates, you know, tools of the trade with a fight. In order to see which of us wins, which of us is right, which of us is wrong, to make you get it. Sound familiar? The regular crowd. Okay, good. In other words, we do the same things with our spouse in a fight that you do with a Coke machine when it doesn't drop a Coke. What do you do? You start banging on it and drinking, you know, you get more aggressive, okay? And that's lots of fun till 1.30 in the morning. But strategically, there are a few problems with a fight. <clears throat> a few problems that timeout will help us with, okay? Let's look at them. Number one, timeout is going to help stop the hurtfulness. Think about it. You say stuff in a fight, once you're triggered in that midbrain, you say stuff from that caveman brain that you don't mean. Once we're triggered there, it's law of the jungle. It's kill or be killed. It's, you know, I want to win at all costs. And that part of us needs to be stopped. That part of us is destructive. It's like stopping an out-of-control child. Remember the inner square, the little six-year-olds? Those are children, and that's what we're being when we're in a fight. So we got to stop those kids. Now, while we're here, let's go ahead and just answer that age-old question. Is the stuff your spouse says when they're really angry what they really mean? You know? And they're like, one ever wanted kids anyway. And you're like, whoa, you know? <laughs> Has this been like lurking in there all these years, you know? <laughs> the answer, you heard it here today, is no. This is not what they really mean. It's what their little six-year-old means, 
All right, their adult part still know better, but once you've triggered the six-year-old, that's who's talking, and they're going to say all sorts of wacky stuff. It's not true. Children think absolutely, ultimately. Okay, so we got to stop the children. Marriage is like fireworks. Do not attempt without adult supervision. we got to get some adult in there, all right? <laughs> but we need a timeout to do that. So first reason timeout's going to be helpful is because people get hurt by cavemen and cave girls, okay? And we got to stop that, all right? And we're going to have to address that hurt later or else. Second reason timeout is helpful. Let me put it this way. The goal of fighting is wrong. You know, the goal of conflict should be that we both matter. You know, you want A, I want B, we work that out, mutuality, whatever. But think about it. What's the goal of a fight? The goal is to win. The goal is to be right. Now, pardon me, but that's a terrible goal. <laughs> um, someone wins and someone loses, for crying out loud. Like, I mean, think about it. Best case scenario, you win. And now you're married to a loser. <laughs> and the loser ain't very happy with you. And they're going to come back and bite you at some point. All right? Think about it. How many win-lose relationships do you know of that last very long? You know, if you go into Starbucks and they're charging eighteen fifty for a cappuccino, then you're probably going to like go, eh, I don't think I'm going to keep coming here. Win for them, lose for me. If you go into Starbucks and start stealing those cool little mugs they have on the shelves and sneaking out with them, that relationship probably won't last very long either. Win for you, lose for them. Win these relationships don't work, okay? The playground principle is this. You can hit the kid who has the ball and get the ball, but it's not going to give you anybody to throw it with, right? So time out. Even if you don't know what to do good, just don't do the bad. None of your solutions when you're triggered emotionally are helpful. By the way, time out is not... Forget it. I'm out of here. Time out, jerk face. Okay? That doesn't count. Um, nor is it uh, silent treatment. What? I'm just taking a time out for 12 days. You know? A woman came up to me after a conference once. She said, I'm never using time out. I just got to tell you. I'm like, what? She goes, oh, it would just give him time to escape. <laughs> He'd be like, oh, yeah, sure, babe, let's take a time out. That's great. You know, you know, six hours later, he'd be at the end of the 19th hole. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, no, oh, I still need a little more time. <laughs> so you got to re-engage. But one of the things I see couples not doing is once you know you're triggered and it's starting to get ugly, you got to stop. Okay? Now, you can call time out on yourself. Golf, not tennis, Remember? Slow it down. I think I need a moment, all right? So um, I, I wrote this adolescence conference once. Um, parenting conferences are easy. Uh, uh, this church asked me to do a conference on adolescence, which is about 70 times harder, and I'd never written it, and I wasn't sure how to write it. And it was very difficult. And one night, I mean, um, one, one evening, I, I figured it out. I was up in my man cave working on it, and I came tumbling down the stairs to tell Norma, I did it. I figured out how to do the, 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 the adolescent conference. And she goes, oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> so you know me by now. What I want to say is, oh, well, thank you for your encouragement. <laughs> You're like, you know, the, the woman who stands behind the man. You know, that's me, Right. <laughs> So I do know that too, and I know, John, whatever it is you want to say right now is not going to be said, so go take a time out, okay? In other words, if you don't know what to say good, just don't say the bad, and we can begin asking, what is going on for me? Why is this hooking me? We can start thinking. You hear the thinking starting to take place? What's going on with me? So what's the question I need to ask Norma? I mean, it's obvious she doesn't care, right? It's obvious. What do I need to ask her? Well, after I simmered down a little bit, I went downstairs and I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, um, are you excited that I figured out how to do the adolescent conference? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, well, you seem real nonplussed when I talked about it, like you really didn't care. And she said, oh, I just got off the phone with my mother. Okay, everything's not about me? I'm confused. You mean that wasn't about me? This is so difficult. 
So time out yourself. Now, let me be honest with you about this and about what that was like for me and what I think it'll be like for you. If you're going to... If you're going to time yourself out, if you're like me, in the moment, you're not going to want to go to timeout. Why? Because it feels good to be a jerk. Tell me I'm not the only one again. In other words, in that moment when I'm mad, I want to be mean. I want to make my point with my finger in her face, and I do not want to let her get away with it. I, I don't, I don't want to go to timeout. So something's going to happen if you go to time out, if you set limits on how you want to be mean, what's going to happen is it's going to feel bad. It's going to feel bad. See, it feels good to be mean when we're angry. Let me tell you why, psychologically why. Why is it hard to let go of a grudge or why is it fun to be mean when you're angry? Because literally it takes some of the shame and cruelty and anger that I have inside. Let's say I have 10 pennies worth of shame and yuckiness inside of me. I don't feel good. But if I can shame you, oh my gosh, that's, what were you thinking? If I can shame you, it like takes eight of those ten pennies and dumps them on you. Now I only have two pennies left. It feels great. If I can take some of my junk and dump it on you, I get rid of it. That's why it feels good to be mean when we're angry rather than holding on to it. Temporarily, I just now have two pennies. Now the problem is, you got the freaking Denver Mint inside of you just pumping out more pennies, all right? So you're going to have them back. But temporarily, it feels good, all right? So we got to stop that part of us. Now, secondly, you can stop your spouse. Time out your spouse. This is relevant to an unrepentant spouse. Super important to that spouse who kind of habitually is a jerk and doesn't care. They come in the house going, what are you thinking parking like that? All right? I want you to say... You know, I don't have conversations that start like that. I mean, you kind of walk in the door with guns blazing. I don't even think I want to engage that, all right? What the victims usually say is, well, I thought that you would want to take the garbage out later, okay? And they wonder why they're still being treated like this, okay? Your jerky spouse will take your cue. If you are willing to answer a question that's delivered like that, you're, in essence, giving them a signed affidavit. I, John Cox, give you permission to talk to me like that. And then later on, we're like, why is he such a jerk? Well, you keep responding. Norma and I were having a conflict once, and, and I got ugly. And she said, did you mean that to be mean? Because we were having a good conversation here, albeit a conflictual one. But, but all of a sudden, that felt like you wanted to hurt me. I think if you want to hurt me or be mean, I think I'll need us to stop for a little bit. And all of a sudden, I'm left with this really interesting choice. Do you see the position it puts me in? That's what I meant last night when I said the only thing that makes actor outers or jerky people grow is having a limit set on me. Only then am I going to have to stop and kind of go, well, is she important enough? Is this important enough for me to actually work to try to change? Okay. And as we said last night, good rules are always, good limits are always a good rule about me. Like, I'm not going to talk to you if you do that. Not uh, controlling, all right? I see so few oppressed spouses do this. I have so many spouses in my office who come and do the he language, she language. You won't believe this. And a lot of people come in and go, you're not going to believe it. She yelled at me for four hours last night. And I always, like, look at their feet. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm just making sure you had feet because I'm wondering why you were kept standing there while she yelled at you for four hours, you know? I wanted to make sure. So setting limits. I'm not really willing to engage you if you are hurtful like that. In other words, I'm going to time out this. That actually protects you. It protects the relationship. It helps them grow toward godliness. This is way underused. I do it all the time at work. Um, way underused by churches. We misinterpret the turn the other cheek thing. But it's the only way that hurtful people grow is by encountering a limit that doesn't come with anger, but just some poison power, all right? Third reason that timeout's important is it's going to give us a chance to think. The fourth I again. This is where we're trying to head in this fight, is to get back to your frontal lobes, okay? The only thing that's going to work us out of a fight and a conflict is for you to start thinking. We've got to move up to some frontal lobes. I'm talking executive functioning people, Okay? And it's going to take 5 to 20 minutes physiologically for that to happen, but timeout's going to need to 
buy us that. It's going to, it's going to give us the chance to do that. Um, so we need to think and start asking questions. What am I needing? Why is this hooking me so much? Um, what's going on for me there? Um, a, a couple last night asked a question, and also I looked at a couple of questions we got from the, um, from the um, Google Voice, um, and, and um, it, it, was, it was about this, about how do you make sense of, um, shoot, I can't quote the question right now. Um, oh yeah, there were questions about, you're talking about those injuries, the, the incomplete parts of you. Um, abilities you don't have. How do you distinguish that from blaming your parents? You're making excuses. Well, you know, I was poorly parented, so I don't have that ability, and it's mom and dad's fault. What's the difference between what we're doing and that? Well, the difference is that what we're doing is diagnostic. I want you to have categories so you can start understanding why things trigger you, understanding why you do these things, understanding why you can't do these things. Not to blame anybody, but it's sort of like your arm's broken and I'm the doctor. Now, did you fall out of a tree house or did you get hit by a car? That makes a difference in how I treat you. I need to understand. And I want you thinking in your marriage, huh, I went off like a crazy person when you said that. What's going on for me? And having an understanding of where our blind spots are there, even historically, developmentally, is going to give us clues to that. Thinking and starting to understand. So I was talking to a couple Thursday. And uh, she had asked him, hey, on your way home from work, will you run through the Chick-fil-A line and pick us up some dinner? He says, sure. And, you know, the Chick-fil-A line's like five times around the building. And he's calling and going, man, you're not going to believe this. Is like line is like crazy. It's like, I don't know what their secret is. but they, you know." And he's carrying on, and she all of a sudden triggers and gets mad and says, well, if you don't want to be there, just fine. You should have just told me that in the first place. And she starts picking this fight. And he starts going into apologize little boy in trouble mode, and they bring this to the session. And so I'm asking her, now that we can think about it, I said, what was going on for you about that? And I know her pretty well. And I said, you know, my guess is I know that you live with this ongoing sense that you've done bad and you've inconvenienced people and what you need is a hassle of them and they resent you for it. And you heard him saying that the Chick-fil-A line was long and it felt to you like he was saying, I can't believe you're so mean that you made me do this. And she said, exactly. I felt like he was telling me that I ruined his night. Now she can start talking to him about what her heart needs. You see how we moved from a fight where she was reactive. Once she was able to slow down in the session and start thinking, she was like, oh, I know what I really was. I was really afraid you were upset at me. And so I jumped on you. Okay. That's where thinking is going to get us, to back up in that time out to go, what am I needing here? All right? We are smart up here. We are dumb back here. Okay? And time out buys us that time to get out of what all those feelings are saying and start asking ourselves, what are they about? Now, if you don't know what they are about, you probably need external eyes to do that. I know I do lots of times. I can't figure out why I'm doing this or feeling that. That's your body of Christ people again. Okay? But step one is time out to not let those feelings run things. You know how Obi-Wan says to Luke, Luke, trust your feelings, right? Well, Obi-Wan is wrong, all right? He's wrong, all right? That's why he had to live on Tatooine all by himself, because nobody can maintain a relationship with a woman thinking like that. You know, you become a hermit. You live out in the desert flats near the sand people. I mean, what else are you going to do? All makes sense now, right? All right, so time out, super important. All right, now what's all this thinking going to give us? Step two, we're going to go bird's eye. Secret of the universe, as we said this morning, is that marriage problems are not cause and effect. Marriage problems are cyclical. I do A, which makes you do B, which makes me do A more, which makes you do B more. And that is like what we do. Now, one of the most powerful things you can do in your marriage and in your dating and in your conflicts is to begin learning and asking, what is this thing we're doing? To go bird's eye, in essence, fly on the wall and back up and go, what are we doing? I do A and you do B, and we're doing that thing again. Hey, Sherlock, we're doing it again, all right? A lot of the value of marriage therapy or marriage conferences, for that matter, is even if your therapist is like a total knucklehead, 
just having somebody outside of your system to look in at it from the outside is super helpful, okay? You get that perspective and you get power over the situation. Here's an example of going bird's eye. Norm and I used to have, historically, when our kids were little mostly, uh, what we came to call the whose day is worse war. And it went something like this. I would come in from work sort of slumped over with my coat and my computer case, you know, basically <clears throat> assuming my I had a bad day posture, you know, um, and stare blankly at Norma and say something like, hey, sort of like, you should feel real sorry for me for how hard I worked all day, <laughs> providing for your family. Now, the problem is that the source of my adoration is blankly slumped over the stove over there cooking something I probably don't want for dinner. And she says, hey, could you set the table? As if to say, welcome home from your eight-hour vacation. All right? Now, I don't know about her, but I've been helping people all day. And I'm tired. So I say something like, well, I'm going to rest just a second as if to say, how could you ask me to do anything? All you've been doing is riding around in a minivan, you know? And basically, her feeling is, well, at least you've had adult conversation. You've changed people's lives. I've spent the whole day at the sick room at the pediatrician. You know, and that, the, the ongoing fight forever is who's going to be appreciated for how hard their life is, right? Here are the two ticks and no dog again, though. Again, we're both trying to get the other one to, all right. And here the win-lose, which one of us is going to get what we need at the expense of the other? You learning yet? Okay. Now what bird's eye does is backs up and observes that dance and goes, what are we doing? Bird's eye is going to ask two questions. What are we doing and what am I doing? In other words, what's going on with me? So number one, what are we doing? Norman and I need to back up. We need to time out first. Um, we need to back up and ask, what are we doing? We've done this enough times. And ultimately we did. You know, I think what's going on is I, I think I'm trying to get some appreciation for how hard my day was. Well, I am too. Well, good. It's something we both need. Let's figure out how to give it to each other. You see, it takes that perspective to start asking that, all right? So we're both trying to out-pitiful each other. We need to get a line judge chair, like I said, that kind of sits out and watches our marriage and asks what's going on. What are we doing now, hear that key word there, we. Okay, you've moved from third-person pronoun to first-person plural. Just that we is going to change the dynamic. Um, think what most fights are. You, no, you, no, you, no, you. You get a couple start asking we, what are we doing? Why do we keep doing this? And you get people taking a lot of steps forward. Well, when you said that, I think it meant this to me, so I felt stupid, so I struck back. Yeah, right, and that's, my, my dad always used to say that to me, so I just wanted to, like, hurt you, you know, and, and we start getting this perspective on it, all right? Somebody called this doing a conflict postmortem. In other words, you kind of back up and go, I think what was going on with me was this. That's super important, and it's so going to hedge your bets for the next time, okay? Because there will be a next time. There will be. There will be. All right, secondly, I need to ask myself, bird's eye on myself, what's going on for me? This is what that woman did with the Chick-fil-A line. Why is this like triggering me? What's going on with me? You know that, that, that sense where you realize the fight's gotten way bigger than it should have, or I'm triggered way bigger than I should be? It's like two plus two is equaling seven in my heart. Like what's going on? All right. Well, when I've time outed, I need to be asking myself, where that extra three come from, man? Okay? And this can be some way you've wounded me in the past that we've never resolved or something that I keep asking you to change and you don't. Or it can be something developmental, like something in my history, like childhood wounds, um, some need that's lacking, and the inner kid hears it and starts coming out and beating you up about it. I call those legacy hurts or legacy triggers, and they just sit in the background until we're disagreeing about car insurance, and like, boom, you know, and your spouse is like, whoa, where'd that come from? You know, like Anchorman, that escalated quickly. I killed a man with a trident. Um, so uh, another story about me, Norma wrote a book years back about Camp DeSoto, a camp in Alabama, and um, she, she asked me to edit a chapter. So would you look through this chapter and make some edits? Well, you know, I'm an English major, and I 
I'm a writer and whatnot, so I'm glad to do that for you. So I go off and I make all sorts of little marks and little ideas and all this, and I proudly come back and I said, here, I went through your chapter. And she went, oh, good, thanks. I keep waiting for, you know, the adoration, you know, never happens. I'm mad. All right, now, fortunately, I time myself out again. And she goes, are you okay? And I'm like, uh-uh, I'm like totally triggered. I like want to like scream and yell and not like a baby. She says, why? And I'm like, I don't know why. Anyway, I'm going to think about it. So I went and I figured it out. Okay, I did. I figured it out. I was one of those kids. I was raised in the 60s. You know, my childhood looks like mad men. All right. Um, I was raised in the, you know, look, I made a good report card. You know, you know, are y'all proud of me? And, you know, make mom and daddy proud of you, that kind of thing. And so something in me was wanting Norman to go, oh, my gosh, John, this is so wonderful. Can we put it on the refrigerator? You know? <laughs> like, well, okay. You know? If you want. So can I go bird's eye on my own reaction and go, wow. Okay, so I told Norman, I said, yeah, there's something wrong. But it's not between you and me. It's between me and, you know, mom or dad or whatever, Okay. Now, if you cannot figure that out, or if y'all can't figure out the bird's eye together, that's your sign that you need to externalize to do it. People often ask me, like, well, how do you know if you need marriage therapy? That's how. If you can't go objective on yourself or on your marriage, then you need somebody who has other eyes. Okay? Not hard. All right, step three. We go time out, we go bird's eye, we address the hurt. This is key. One of the big differences between a conflict and a fight has to do with hurt. Once we're fighting, we're going to hurt each other, and we got to fix that or we're toast. Basically, hurt's a, psychologically just a shorthand. It means a lot of things. What does it mean to be hurt? I'm minimized. I feel shamed. I feel rejected. I feel disregarded. I feel thrown under the bus. I feel like you don't care. I mean, think of all the things it means when we say you hurt me. But those are the things that happen in a fight. We say, I can't believe how stupid you are. Or, you know, I get, somebody like, puts me down at a party and you just stand there and don't take my side. Like, what, you don't care? You feel the hurt? Or, you know, you come in from work and your husband comes in from work and he's like, God, this house is like a bomb went off in it. Like, what'd you do all day? You know, it's men with ski masks come in and search the place for drugs. I mean, what, what have you been doing? You know, hurt. You get it? Now, secret of the universe. One of the reasons that people have trouble making fights in good or moving on or resolving things is because most humans do not know how to resolve hurt once we've caused it. We don't know. It's like not in our skill set. And that's a real problem because now that you've gotten in a fight and now that you've hurt your spouse, until you address that hurt and resolve it, you ain't going nowhere, boy, all right? Now the issue is not the, you know, the in-laws or the finances. It's the hurt, okay? Like what was a conflict and a problem turned into a fight, and now the only thing they're thinking about and that you're thinking about is the hurt. So the only way we're going to get back from this is we're going to have to deal with the last problem first, the hurt first. Now what do you think you need to resolve hurt. When you're hurt, what do you need? Want to take a shot at it? Love and support. Validated. Okay, good, right. What we need, I call understanding or hearing. In other words, I'm not real big on apologies. If you've hurt me, for you to come and say you're sorry, that's sweet, but actually, I'm not really interested in hearing more about your feelings right now. I'd rather you talk to me about understanding what you did to mine. You know, when I did that, that must have made you feel so stupid. When I said that, it must have made you feel like I didn't care about you at all. When that happened, you must have felt like I just was only thinking about myself. You hear I'm talking about you? That's sweet, man. I mean, you know, an apology is copper. This is gold. Apologies are great. But, but I want you to back it up with a real understanding of what the injury was, okay? And if that doesn't happen, people will not let go of it. So somehow we have to get the sense across in order to heal hurt that you get it, you understand, you care. 
or at least you're trying to. Now, this is not complicated, all right? You experience this all the time in everyday life. You're driving down the interstate, and some guy cuts in front of you, and you go, oh my gosh, what an idiot. But then you see, he looks in his rearview mirror and kind of gives you this way. And you're like, oh, he knows he's an idiot. Okay, you know, and y'all are friends now. <clears throat> all right, it's all better. That was easy. Well, what we all need is a rearview mirror wave in our marriages, okay? In other words, what does it look like for me to communicate, yeah, I get it, that from your perspective, that would have felt terrible, and I did that, and, and, and I, I really want to see that as valid. That's where we get the term validation. I see what you're experiencing and why you're angry or why you're hurt as valid. I'm going to give that to you in some way, all right? Now, this does not mean that we're agreeing with them. We're not throwing the match here. We're just trying it on, all right? And, it, and, and very often, one of the reasons you might find yourself stuck and not let, able to let go of a hurt is because you haven't been heard there. So, a classic story about me and Norma. She needed a new doctor, and there was this great new doctor at the hospital. My office is connected with the hospital, so um, I'm just going to call her Dr. Whitney. Um, super cool, super professional, just loved her, and she and I parked near each other and would often walk in the hospital and... Um, Anyway, so Norman needs a doctor. I said, well, I know exactly who you ought to see is Dr. Whitney. I said, I'll talk to her. I'll see you in the doctor's park and before you know it. Well, two weeks go by and I never see her. And Norman's like, I really need a doctor. I'm like, okay. Tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stalk her. I'm going to like get there early. I'm going to bring a granola bar and some orange juice, get there at 730 or so and just sit in the parking garage and she'll show up. So I get there, listen to the radio, sitting, waiting, you know, 20, 30 minutes, and up drives Dr. Whitney. And I get out of the car and I go, Dr. Whitney, what a surprise. Can't believe I'm running into you. Anyway, my wife needs a doctor. I want her to see you. She says, great. Tell her to call so-and-so. So, like, the next Tuesday, she sees Dr. Whitney. So, we're eating dinner, and I'm like, so, you saw Dr. Whitney? She's like, yeah. She was awesome. And she thought that story about you stalking her in the parking garage was so great. <laughs> no, Cute. That's the word. She thought it was so cute. I was enraged. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. You told her? You told her? She goes, no, yeah, it's no big deal. She thought it was cute. Like, I don't want her to think I'm cute. That's not cool. Cute's not cool. <clears throat> anyway, I was mad. I was hurt. And I was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. She's she not even thinking about it. Let it go. Well, anyway, a couple of months later, I realized I'm still hiding from Dr. Whitney, you know. I see her in the hospital, and I'm just kind of like, you know, I'll get my lunch later. Um, so I'm realizing I'm still amped up about this, and I realized I needed Norm to meet me there. And so I asked her, I said, would you, I need to talk about the Dr. Whitney thing, because I, I, I can't let go of it. And I told her the story from my perspective, and she got it. And she said, oh, my gosh. For you, you went out of your way as my husband to care for me and put yourself in this really kind of silly position to find me this doctor. And I, it, it, to you, it feels like I just threw you under the bus. Like, that wasn't my story to tell. And I made you look, at least it felt foolish to you in front of her. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> okay, that's your, that's your tell, guys. That's your key word. That's when, that's when you know you've gotten to their heart. They go, yes. Okay, you get it. Okay? If that never happens, they're never going to let go of the hurt. And they're going to be bringing it up years later. This is like that time on our honeymoon. You know, and you're going to be wondering, what are you talking about? You know, because they haven't been able to let it go. All right? Now, that's great. And Norma helped me get over it. But why might we resist doing that? Why might this be hard for Norma to do? Why might we not want to go there? Well, I'll tell you the reason for me, the reason I don't like hearing someone or talking to them about how I've hurt them or hearing from their perspective or caring or validating where they are is it feels really close to getting to where I'm agreeing I'm the bad guy. I mean, Norma really might feel if she really tries this on and talks to me about it, it's really close to her saying, wow, John, you know, I, I, I really get it, and I can't believe that you have to live with such a terrible person and you were a victim of her evil scheme, you know. Now, face it, nobody's going to do that, and they shouldn't, all right? Number one, because it's not true, okay? 
We don't want to be the bad guy. It's not like I'm saying, yeah, I am this person. We're going to resist that. But number two, we haven't heard her side of the story yet. And this is key. Let me tell you one of the reasons that we fight. Most people fight because they're fighting for the floor to get that hearing that Norma gave me. What we're wanting in a fight is for you to get me. Now, I say, well, that made me feel humiliated. And what does our spouse say? Well, you think I wasn't? You hear it? We're fighting for the floor. I felt you just, all you do is work. Well, I'm trying to provide for this family. Do you hear it? These people are fighting to be understood. All right? And all of a sudden, we're back to sort of the badness hot potato. Me, no me, no me, no me. And most fights are people saying, I want you to get me. I want you to get how this was hard for me. No, I want you to get how it's hard for me. That's what most of your fights are. Okay? Fighting to see who's going to get that, yes, experience that Norma gave me. So, in order to avoid that fight, we're going to use another very deep psychological technique. We're going to take turns. <laughs> I went to school for decades to learn this stuff. So after Norma has heard me, and I'm all fat and happy about Dr. Whitney, she gets to say, can I have a turn? You're going to get a turn. Better yet, I need to say, yes, that's it. Now, is there anything I can give you? What do you need? You're going to get a turn. And I want you all to write this down. We're going to give each other a turn. Norman and I, sometimes when we have a fight, we'll go, okay, 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 okay. I think I went first last fight. You go first this time, all right? <laughs> but we're going to take turns. And I'm going to hear her side, even though I want to go, oh, I did not say it like that. You know, I'm going to say, wow. So, I mean, not only did it feel like I was angry, but I was like cutting to you. Yes. All right. Now, later on, I'm going to get a turn. I'm going to get to say, Actually, I had a stomach ache that day, and it wasn't me being... I can come back. I will get another turn, all right? But Norma gets to come back and have a turn, and maybe she would say something like she said, which was, yeah, I actually, I, there is something I would like to say about this whole story. I think you gave me and Dr. Whitney a whole lot of power here. I mean, to be honest, I think a lot of your own shame is in this. You want her to think you're hot stuff, and I kind of spoil that by telling a silly husband story on you, and I'd kind of like you to own some of that. I mean, this wasn't just all me. Which, A, is correct. I did want Dr. Whitney to think I was cool. That was my own narcissism, good shooting norms, okay? B, I've got to hear that either way, because if I don't, then she's not going to get heard, and she's going to feel dismissed, and we're going to be back to the badness hot potato again. Okay, so the only way we're going to resolve this is for us to take turns trying to hear where the other person is. Now, what this often means is that most fights are two fights. You have the first fight where it's like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll say it again. And you go at each other until somebody calls time out. And then you go bird's eye and look at what's going on. And then you have this second kind of, quote, fight where you go, okay, I think this is what this was going on for me. And, and, and let me hear what's going on for you. And that's where you take care of each other in that second fight. <clears throat> so, healing, he, he, hearing heals hurt. The three H's. All right? You've heard of the 4-H club. This is the 3-H club. Hearing somebody. I get it. That's what heals us. <clears throat> All right. Final step. And we're going to wrap this up. We've got to solve the problem. Remember the whole problem that started this in the first place? Here's the target. Remember, we started off saying that, by definition, a fight is hopeless because it is essentially a win-lose. Well, buckaroos and buckarets, no fight is ever going to get better, no problem is ever going to get solved until you both matter in the solution and we create a win-win. <clears throat> Now, what that means is, as we're trying to figure out this problem that got us in the fight in the first place, some fights don't start with a problem. Some fights just start with the cutting remark. But a lot of fights start with a problem. Um, should we sell this house or not? Well, I want to stay. Well, I don't. Well, we always do what you want, and you get in a fight because of the problem. The goal here is mutuality, not winning. The goal here is for you both somehow to come out with some of what you want. I call that a win-win. Now, what that means is what your spouse wants or what your girlfriend wants 
has got to matter in the solution as much as yours, even if that's not what you want. But the day you said, I do, one of the things you said, I do to was, do you agree to no longer live your life just based on what you want? Do you? I do. All right. <laughs> Good news is your spouse said that too. But anyway, our family used to have an annual fight about uh, Christmas card pictures in the South. We send Christmas card pictures of your children out. Merry Christmas is a picture of your kids. And, you know, with three girls, inevitably, there was this crisis every year because we'd have, you know, like 9,000 photographs, you know, you know, copies from the look at. And, then, you know, and, and, and they would always fight over which one they would use. And one year they reached a complete stalemate, these three girls, because any two could agree on one, but all three wouldn't. There would always be one who's like, no, no, not that one. My hair's poofy. Okay, so we couldn't use that one. So they were getting nowhere, and finally I intervened, and I said, look, basically you guys agree on something. Find a picture you can at least tolerate, or we're picking the picture. And so they all compromised and picked a picture, which all of them were sort of unhappy about. And Callie, my oldest one, who's now a therapist, said, oh, I get it. Um, so if I could actually pick the picture I liked, at least someone in the family would be happy. The way it is currently, everybody is mutually unhappy. And I said, exactly. Welcome to marriage. Okay. <laughs> My clients love this. They're like, now we're both unhappy, Doc. Thanks, you know. <laughs> but seriously, win-win is not a solution. It's a covenant. It's a commitment. Let me tell you another reason that we fight. Another reason that we fight is because we're scared. In other words, scared if I don't fight you to control you, you're going to get what you want, take what you want, and under the bus I go. So I'm going to try to take from you before you can take from me, and presto, you have a fight. All right? So win-win is this covenant. It's this commitment. It's not like here's a two-step plan for resolving problems. Finding a win-win is hard. But it's the, it, the, the, the power of it is in the commitment that says, I can promise you that in our relationship, I'm not just going to take and say, you know, to heck with you. And you're not going to just take and say to heck with me. I commit to that. Like the Marines, no man left behind. And if a couple gets to the place where they can know, you know, you know I want to sell the house and you don't, but one of the things I know that's not going to happen is all of a sudden, you know, we're just going to be stuck in this house forever or that you're going to sell it out from under me. I'm not going to get messed over in the story. That trust and that commitment is just huge, and it lies at the base of so much conflict that we don't trust one another for a win-win. So that's a conversation to have. Do we covenant this for each other? If I want Mexican and you want Chinese, one of the things we know is not going to happen is I'm just going to get Mexican tough on you, or you're going to take Chinese tough on me. We're going to get Mexican and run by and get you Chinese takeout. Or we're going to go to Chili's and get a Southwestern egg roll. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to find a solution to where we both matter. All right? I was seeing this couple a while back, and he wanted to go to med school, and she wanted to have babies. Okay, so what did all his med school dreams mean to her having babies? Mm. What did her having babies mean to his med school dreams? Hmm. And you have every marriage I know, right? And they could feel the win-lose lurking there, like which one of us is going to get to live the life they want. And they were scared, and they, they fought about it, and um, took it out on each other. But I tried to get them to start thinking in a win-win category, like how can we start creating a place where I give some, you give some, and we both matter here. And he started thinking about, well, maybe I could like, look at doing nurse prac school instead of full MD. And she goes, yeah, and uh, I've got some investments from my granddad. Maybe we could get somebody to look at that and see if that could supplement us and you could still go. But they started thinking together. You know, it's amazing how smart couples can get once they stop fighting. You know, because that's what marriage is, is two people who solve problems together, not fight. All right. Now, like I say, that's hard. And, and, and sometimes when people can't reach a win-win, they're just stuck. Like I used the example of the sell the house, not sell the house. I had a couple who basically had just built this house, and the wife wanted to sell it. And I was just like, what? We just built it. And she's like, I'm not budging. I want to sell it. And he's like, I no way I'm selling it. We, helped, we designed this house, and they're stuck. And so, you know, you can't be a moron psychologist and go, well, you guys need to win-win. You know, cut the house in half. I don't know what they're supposed to do. <laughs> You'll feel that sense sometimes of like, 
how do we win-win this? Well, with them, we had to go bird's eye as to why is this, with couples who get stuck with a committed, I'm not budging, I'm going to die on this hill, I want them to start going bird's eye on themselves. Like, why, why am I willing to die on this hill? Why does this mean so much to me? Now, to her credit, she got really quickly to saying, you know what it is for me? It's all the stuff dad taught me about money. I'm terrified about finances. And I just want to sell this house and have the money back in the bank. And once she started understanding what was driving that, now they could start looking at it. And so you see how these tie together? We're going to stop that fight. We're going to start backing up and going bird's eye. What is this meaning to her or to them? We're going to be looking at hurt that they've created. We start thinking about how do we work to let both, both of us matter in all of this. All right? But there's always a solution if you stop trying to win. Now, write these down, put them in your bookcase, like that. Like, like when Norman and I were doing marriage therapy ourselves, I wrote down all these things my therapist would say, and we'd start getting in a fight, and I'd go, wait a minute. I'd be like, okay, well, like, okay don't say that. All right, uh, um, you know, because you're going be, to be triggered like reptile brain boy back here, caveman, okay? And you're going to need some frontal lobe stuff. Write this down. Don't trust your memory on this. And in regard to all of this stuff, body of Christ, reaching for people outside of you. 